Check. Check, check, check. Check, check, check. Good morning. Yes, thank you back there. Hello, good morning. Hey, listen, uh, for one thing if you could help me with this morning. We do have more people filing in, so if you don't mind, if you, there's an empty chair, scoot inside this direction. Over here, you guys scoot this way to the inside aisle. Try to be friendly this morning, so if you have some empty chairs, just kind of scoot in to the inside aisles, and that will help some more people as they come in. A few more chairs available in the bleachers. We're looking good. Be friendly and invite somebody to sit beside you. Try to be Christian about it today. Check, check, check. Well, hey, we're almost ready to get started. We have some, we have chairs right here in the very, towards the very front. We've got chairs over here. We've still got some room in the bleachers if you're coming in. Want everybody to get a nice chair, feel comfortable. Got a few chairs over here as well. Some chairs on this side. There's some prime seating right here. Three chairs right there in the front. You can, you, you can sit by Mr. Tomlinson. It's VIP seating right there. Right there. We're ready to get started.
Hey, I'm Christine and I wanna thank you for joining us for Worship in the Warehouse today. We're glad you're here and hope you find a place to live sent at First Baptist Starbull. If you're looking for a community of people here, we have community groups that meet every Sunday at 8.45 a.m. They're a great place to grow spiritually and meet other people at our church. If you're new with us today, we'd love to know you visited and help you take your next step at First Baptist Starbull. The best way to do that is to fill out a connect card. You can grab one from the guest services table and drop it in an offering drop box. If you're a first time guest, make sure to bring your connect card to the guest services table after the service so we can bless you with a guest box. In it, you'll find some more information about our church, a free book and discounts from some of our local businesses. We're about to get started. So from wherever you are right now, let's sing, pray and learn together. Yes, good morning and good morning to you all. Great to see you. We made it. I think we're almost all in. So this is fantastic. Wonderful. Welcome to June. Welcome to Warehouse Worship. You know, we're here today because, of course, we're doing some renovation in the sanctuary. If you've been over to the uh, commons area, anything, it's kind of shocking to see all the pews stacked out all in everywhere but the sanctuary. So we're, ma we're making some more progress over there. We'll be in here for a few weeks, and we'll let you know, of course, when we're going to be back in the sanctuary. Now, today we have a very special service. Uh, go ahead and let you know, at the, towards the end of the service, we're going to be celebrating the Lord's Supper together. Now, today we're going to do it a little differently. We're going to invite you to come forward to receive the Lord's Supper. Um, and the way we'll do that is we'll have some men stationed across the front here, and they'll each have in their hands a, a, a basket of bread and a cup of juice. And as you come forward, you'll take a piece of bread, and then you'll dip it in the juice, and then, of course, eat it, take it that way. And we'll have some people to help with the uh, traffic control, but basically we're going to go from the insides here. We're going to dismiss you row by row. You'll come from the inside. You'll just come around, come down through the front, and then go right around and return to your chairs that way. On this side, you'll just be coming out the center aisle, going around this direction, and going back to your chairs. There'll be a person stationed for the bleacher section on either side of our gym sanctuary today, on either side. And all of you on this side of the bleachers, y'all will head over to that direction. Over here, you'll go to that direction. This will be at the end of the service today. Now, if by chance you're not comfortable taking the Lord's Supper today, you just remain seated. Not a big deal. Don't worry about that at all, all right? We're going to celebrate the Lord's uh, providence, the Lord's blessing, the Lord's presence today. So with that, let's stand together. Let's begin our worship. Praise God. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy praise him today because of the great things that he has done is doing and will do come let us worship our king come let us bow at his feet he has done great things see what our savior has done see how his love overcomes he has done great things, He has done great things. O oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave, you free every captive and break every chain. O oh, God, you have done great things, we dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh, God, you have done great things. You 
You've been faithful through every storm. You'll be faithful forevermore. You have done great things. And I know you will do it again. For your promise is yes and amen. You will do great things. God, you do great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus. Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God, you have done great things. Oh, hallelujah, God, above it all, hallelujah, God, unshakable, hallelujah, you have done great things. Above it all, hallelujah, God, unshakable, hallelujah, you have done great things, you've done great things, oh hero of heaven, you conquered the grave, you free every captive and break every chain, oh God, you have done great things, we dance in your freedom awake and alive oh jesus our savior your name lifted high oh god you have done great things yes you have done great things oh god you do great things heavenly father we praise you this morning for the great things that you have done in our lives in times past. We praise you this morning for the things that you do today. And even now, Father, you're at work in our presence. Your spirit is here. Father, we acknowledge your presence and the spirit. And we pray that you continue to do great things in our lives as we listen for your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And please have a seat. lost its hold I know on that final day I'll rise as Jesus rose on that day we will see you shining brighter than the sun on that day we will know you as we lift our voice as one till that day we will praise you for your never-ending grace and we will keep on singing on that glorious day what a blessed hope though now tired and warm we will spend eternity around our savior's throne Though we grieve our losses, we grieve not in vain. For we know our crown of glory waits beyond the grave. On that day, we will see you shining brighter than the sun. 
on that day we will know you as we lift our voice as one till that day we will please you for your never-ending grace we will keep on singing on that glorious day open wide, I will see my Father who is waiting for me. Hallelujah, what a joy it will be. For at home with you my joy is complete. And as I run into your arms open wide, see my father who is waiting for me yes my father who is waiting for me and on that day we will see you shining brighter than the sun on that day we will know you as we lift our voice as one Till that day we will praise you for your never-ending grace and we will keep on singing on that glorious day on that day we will see you shining brighter than the sun on that day we will know you as we lift our voice as one till that day we will praise you for your never-ending grace, and we will keep on singing on that glorious day, and we will keep on singing on that glorious day. Tried to hit the stage right as it said, boom. Anyway, I missed it. <laughs> Let me ask you a question this morning. Can you know God? Can you know God? Now think about that question. I really want you to think about it. Not can you know about God, but can you truly know God? And if you can, then how? How is it that you can know God? Listen to this statement. There is no knowledge of Jesus Christ outside of the Bible. There is no knowledge of Jesus Christ outside of the Bible. Now let's back that up for just a moment. There is no knowledge of God apart from the Bible. And there is no knowledge of God except through Jesus Christ. And so there is, the way that we come to know God is through Jesus Christ. And the way that we know who Jesus is is through His Word. So for example, when you open the Bible, 
and you have Jesus amongst us, the question is, well, then who is this Jesus who is amongst us? And then what does he tell us about who God is? For example, he says, when you pray, pray this way, our Father who art in heaven. Now that tells us a little bit of something about who God is. For example, also in Matthew 28 in the Great Commission passage, what does he say? He says, go therefore and make disciples, baptizing them in the name, listen, of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so when we start to think about who God is, we have this knowledge of how we come to know God. Jesus, who is the eternal Son, he tells us that when we pray, we are to pray to God as our Father who art in heaven, whose name is holy. So go back to that question. Can you know God? Not can you know about God, but can you truly know God? And what is it then that we come to know about God? We know God as Father. You know what that tells us? It tells us that God desires a relationship. But not only God desires a relationship with us, we understand that God is a God of relationship. So when we speak of God as Father, we are saying something essentially about who God is. And don't let that word essential scare you. It just simply means whatever it means to be God, God is. And here's what we know about God. God is Father. And that word Father says something about who God is. It tells us that essentially He is a God, listen, who exists in eternal communion. For example, when you hear the word Father, you know what's presupposed in that statement? That there's a Son somewhere. And when you hear the word Son, we automatically think, well, there must be a Father somewhere. So oftentimes I think that when we think about God, and especially as we're explaining God to our children, we have this idea that, well, we, we get to God through Jesus Christ, and that's sort of the way that we think about it, and so we sort of part God in the middle. We think, well, there must be another God somewhere else that Jesus is taking us to. But see, here's, here's the point. As one theologian said, there is no God behind the back of Jesus. Listen to that. There is no God behind the back of Jesus. So when Jesus is walking around, he says things like, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I and the Father are one. Now that's important. What's he saying there? Because you cannot have a son without a father. And you cannot have a father without a son. And so just by our Lord teaching us who he really is as Father... That language of God, our Heavenly Father, lets us think automatically as we should as Christians. If there's a Father, then there's a Son. And we know something else about, because we have the revelation of God, we know that since there's a Son, there's also a Spirit. And the reason we know that is just simply because God told us. So saying that God is Father is saying something about what God is, or rather, who God is essentially. This is what it means. This is the good news of Christianity. Listen to it. God is Father. God is Son. God is Holy Spirit. And there is this eternal bond that exists between Father, Son, and Spirit. And this is the good news of Christianity. Through Jesus Christ, by the Spirit, we're invited into that relationship. So then, listen, Jesus now teaches us that when we pray, we pray our Father who art in heaven. When we were in South Asia, we were at this particular holy site of this major world religion, and you literally, as Nathan and the others were talking about last week, you had to go through the waters. You had to go through the waters to go to this holy site, and here right underneath right underneath this section where they were preparing food for, to offer to their idols, 
there was this man who was speaking over the loudspeakers. He was speaking over the loudspeakers in that language and dialect, and I didn't understand what he was saying. But thankfully, right above where the food is sacrificed to idols, there is this screen that has the section of the Scripture, and it also has the section of the Scripture along with the English of what the Scripture is saying. And on the screen, on the Scripture, read something like this. He has saved us for the sake of his holy ones. That was what they kept repeating. He has saved us for the sake of his holy ones. And I went and I asked my God, who was formerly part of this religion, who was saved from that religion. He's now a Christian. I asked the person, I said, who is the he that they're referring to? And his response back to me was, there is no he. He's just an idea. So go back to the question. Can you know God? Not just to know about God, but to actually know who God truly is. Can we know who God is? And that reminded me, that occasion of uh, the, the he has saved us for the sake of his holy ones, it reminded me of a riddle in the book of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 30, and in particular at verse 4. Listen to it. Who has ascended to heaven and come down? Who has gathered the wind in his fist? Who has wrapped up the waters in a garment? Who has established all the ends of the earth? Listen to this phrase. What is his name and what is his son's name? Surely you know. Now this proverb is not going to, it sort of ends there on this riddle. It ends on this riddle letting us know who is this great God who has done all of these mighty things. And then here's the question. What is his name and what is his son's name? And that tells us what I'm trying to tell you this morning. The only way that we can come to know who God is is through Jesus Christ. And the only way that we can, listen to this, the only way that we can know who Jesus Christ is is through the Spirit-inspired Word. Did you hear that? The only way that we can know who God is is through Jesus Christ. And our only knowledge of who Christ is comes through His Spirit-inspired Word. We get to go around very specific in our confession. We get to say, we get to know who God is, and we get to call him by name, and we call him Father, because Father means that there's a Son, and the way that we're able to call him Father is through the Son. The Son taught us to call God the Father, and so now we are then invited into this relationship. The only way that we can get to where he is, the only way that we can comprehend who he is, is he has to invite us into this relationship. But listen to me. Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ, he has given us the invitation. What is his son's name? Surely you know. We're continuing to look at our series looking at the foundations of our faith, and in particular, we're looking at the Apostles' Creed. We're looking at the Apostles' Creed, and we come to this point where we're looking at this phrase. It says, I believe in God the Father. And of course, the next phrase is Almighty, but the reason we're leaving off the Almighty is because that Almighty is really can uh, use a word used that can describe the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But it's so important. I want you to even look at the way that this is written. And by the way, the reason we're looking at this is because this is simply a summary of Christian teaching. This is, if, if I were to come to you and I were to ask you, for example, can you tell me what the Bible is all about? You wouldn't have to fumble around and you wouldn't have to wonder. You simply could have a tool, a resource, and that's what the creed is, a resource to help you better understand what the Bible is. It's a summary of Christian teaching. But look at the way that this is written. I believe in God the Father, and then the next phrase is Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Now, this is important. We don't start with God as maker first. We start with God as Father first, because God is essentially Father. This is really who He is. He's inviting us to know who He is. So the way that we come to know God is by what He tells us about Himself, not through observation, not by looking around and trying to look at God's works. That's what the Greeks do. That's why you have mythology. That's why you have 
the epitome of every man, you know, the Hercules that goes up and tries to slay the gods or whatever the case may be, because he is the epitome of every man. Greek mythology and all the other different religions, they, they start with God as maker first, and then they try to get to this understanding of God. But unless we depend upon who God really is, unless we try to understand God with what he's told us, we will never know who God is. You may be able to look outside, like Abraham Lincoln said. I remember Abraham Lincoln, a quote that was attributed to him, said, I cannot conceive how a man could look up into the heavens and say that there's no God. Well, Mr. Lincoln, what can we say about God other than there must be some cosmic person who put all this together? We as Christians, we get to say something more specific than that. We get to say before God is maker, we understand him as father. And that term means that he desires to have a relationship with us. For example, we can go over to uh, see the Mona Lisa. We almost got stuck in Paris, and I was thinking if we were there for 48 hours, I was going to go try to see the Mona Lisa. But, you know, there's been so many questions about Mona Lisa. Who is this lady with the smile? And we know, of course, who painted Mona Lisa. Well, that's even a question, right? Did da Vinci really paint the Mona Lisa, or did he not? But we don't, we, there's all types of questions that are related to this lady. Who is she? All kind of different theories. She's this, she's that. But you know what we really need? We really need Leonardo da Vinci to come and tell us, this is, this is who this lady is. This is what I intended when I painted her. Well, there's a problem, isn't there? We can't get a hold of da Vinci. He's not here. He's dead. He's silent. But we as believers, we have a better word. We have God who is here, and he is not silent, and he reveals himself to us first as Father. He is our heavenly Father. Now, here's the question that we have, because we want to ground all of this in Scripture. Where do we go to try to understand God as Father? Now, there's a thousand places that we could probably go to try to understand what we mean when we say God is Father, but I invite you to take your Bibles And join me in the book of Hosea. Hosea. It may take you a little while to find that one. It's one of those smaller books tucked away in between those other books that are small. But the book of Hosea is going to tell us what we mean when we say God is Father. Now, let me tell you a little bit about Hosea while you're turning over there and while you're trying to find it. Hosea was a, a, is a, is a prophetic book written during a very tumultuous time in the life of Israel. And in particular, God uses sort of the first half of Hosea. Hosea goes out and marries a prostitute and is told to be faithful to this prostitute who's told to take her back, to go and buy her back from the market of slavery and love her as his very own. And in this little story on the backside of an empire that's already been conquered or will be conquered, God is telling the true story of the whole world. God is taking the circumstances of this one man's life, and he is telling the story of our condition, the story of a humanity that has lost its way, the story of a humanity that was invited to know not just about God, but not to just sort of induce or deduce this knowledge of God, but to actually have knowledge of who God is, to walk with God, to obey Him, to be His delight, to delight in Him. And in the middle of all of this comes Hosea chapter 11. Listen to it. When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. Now, there again, when we hear the word son, what are we automatically supposed to think of? Father. When we hear the word son, that means that there's a father somewhere. So listen to it again. Out of Egypt, I called my son. The more they were called, the more they went away. They kept sacrificing to the Baals and offering burnt offerings to idols. Yet it was I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them up by their arms, but they didn't know that I healed them. I led them with the cords of kindness, with the bands of love, and I became to them as one who eases the yoke on their jaws. And I bent down to them 
and I fed them. Here is this intimate picture that Hosea paints us, paints for us, of the love that God has for his own. The love that God has for his own. I want you to hone in on that again. Listen specifically to everything that I say. We call God the Father. Indeed, he's the creator of all. But don't fall into the trap of thinking that God's everybody's father. In some ways, that's true, but not in the same way that we mean it. Because Jesus says in John chapter 1, he gave us a right through his blood, through redemption, to be called, listen, sons and daughters of God. And so there is this invitation that exists, this knowledge that has been distributed through Jesus Christ and the spreading of the gospel. Now there is a way to know who God is. You don't have to rest with this, yeah, there might be a God somewhere. No, you get to know a God who is called Father. That means that he's a God of relationship. And through redemption, he invites us to be his children. He invites us through redemption to be his very own. Now remember, Jesus is the son by nature. Jesus is God's son by nature. We are God's sons and daughters by grace. We are the sons and daughters of God through amazing grace. Now I want to make a couple of points this morning from this passage. I really want to make, want to make three points about what it means for us to know God And then I want to come in a little specific and look directly at this Hosea text. So just bear with me, and hopefully everything will be clear. Hopefully you're at a place where you can write notes. Write this down, number one. Number one, how do we know who God is? Can we know God? Well, first thing for you to write down to answer that question is that God desires to be known. If not for God desiring to be known, we could not know him. There exists a gap between who we are and who he is. I will never be as he is, but he has become like I am. Do you see that difference? Through Jesus Christ, he has become as I am in order to make me as he is. And what is that language talking about? He enfolds me. He invites me to be part of the divine life. He invites me, listen, to be part of relating with him, the relationship that exists between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now through Jesus Christ, now by the power of the Holy Spirit, we now get to be invited into this relationship. Genesis chapter 1, don't miss this. Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning, God, and then what's it say? Created the heavens and the earth. And oftentimes when we think about Genesis chapter 1, we go right over in the beginning God and we go right past what it says next. Or we go into right what it says next and we start talking about creation. And this is how God created. But we miss this fact that in the beginning, before there was a creation, there was God who existed. And this existence and him existing before creation and then creating, you know what that means? It means that he now invites us to know who he is. Why did he create the world and all that's in it? He created the world, listen, to give space in order for him to be known. He created the world through a desire, and that desire was for him to be known. Oftentimes we think about the Bible, and we think about man and his quest for God. Here is man looking for God, trying to find God. He looks here, he looks there. He tries this religion, he tries that religion. But the Bible tells a different story. The Bible tells a story of not, of, uh, as A.W. Tozer said, not a God who we pursue, but a God who's in pursuit of us. And this is the great benefit of calling God Father. Because it means that he is who he is. And he invites us to know who he is. And that knowledge of him comes by us relating with who he really is. God desires to be known. And the proof of that desire is just to see Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. 
Now, the second thing we need to say about the knowledge of God is not only does God desire to be known, the second thing we should say is that only God can make God known. Since he is who he is, we don't want to have this idea of looking at what God has done to try to discover who he is. For example, you know, we we oftentimes think about, well, um, if it rains today, then God must be pleased. If it thunders and lightnings, then God must be uh, then God must be angry, those kind of things. That's a, that's a wrong way for us to come to the true knowledge of who God is. Only God can make God known. And the way that he has made God known is through, listen, his son, Jesus Christ. And through Jesus Christ, you and I are now invited in to know him, to enjoy him, to delight in him forever. And that's all because of Jesus Christ. And that's exactly who Jesus is. As another creed says, the Nicene Creed, it says Jesus is God of God. He's light of light. Jesus is the only one qualified to tell us who God is, and he does this. For example, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 18, listen to it. It says, through him, that is through Jesus, we have both access, listen to this language, in one spirit to the Father. Jesus is the way that we relate to God. What does he say? He says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He says, I and the Father are one. Remember that passage in Matthew? Baptizing them in the name, singular name, of the different persons of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Which, by the way, this is the best way to really explain the Trinity to your children. It's not to go out and try to talk about water or clouds or particles or four-leaf clovers or shampoo and conditioner, two-in-one. The best way for you to talk about the, uh, the Trinity with your children is just to use the language that Jesus uses. Who is Jesus? He's the Son. Who is the Father? Well, He's the Father. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. That he sent who? Some of you aren't convinced. He sent who? The Son. You see in that language? You know what that language does? It forces us. It forces us to really consider who God is. This is the reason why, for example, they crucified Jesus. Because he, listen to what the charge was. He made himself to be God. He made himself out to be God. And Jesus says to us, that's exactly the point. That's exactly the point. Because who is Jesus? He's the eternal Son of the Father. As we sing at at Christmas time, now in flesh appearing. All we could do before was have passages like Hosea talks about this language of a son. But then Matthew takes this language of out of Egypt I called my son, and he play, out of, from Hosea, Matthew takes this language and talks about what Jesus has done for us. Matthew puts Hosea chapter 11 in the birth narrative of Jesus. So think about this for just a moment. Here is Hosea talking about something that happened back in the book of Exodus. And now Matthew is talking about Hosea, who's talking about Exodus, and he's saying all of that is centered in Jesus Christ. So now we know who the Son is. We know his name. There was an instance in in Genesis where the angel of the Lord, don't miss this, the angel of the Lord, he's wrestling with Jacob. Jacob. And he comes up to him and he says, the angel of the Lord says, what is your name? And the last time that Jacob was asked that question, the last time that he was asked that question, he lied because his daddy told him. He said, what's your name? And he he lied. He said, well, my name is Esau. But now the angel of the Lord comes and he asks him, what is his name? And then Jacob, wrestling with the angel, says, what is your name? And he doesn't answer. And then we come to Proverbs and it says, what's his name? Who is this one who gathers the wind in his fist? Who is this one who does all of these things? And then you look at the particular life of Jesus Christ. 
You see him walking on water. You see him commanding storms. You see him dispelling demons. You see him, um, you see him directing demons and raising the dead. And he tells us what the name of God is. So that, as Philippians says, at the name of who? Jesus. Every knee and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is who? Lord. To the glory of who? God the Father. Now, do you see? We don't need to get past the fact that we believe in God the Father. Because through Jesus, and this is the third thing for you to write down, Jesus, he extends an invitation for us to know who he is. Jesus comes to us with his hands wide open. Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28, he says this. He says, come to me, all you who are burdened and heavy laden. He said, and in me you will find rest. Let me read that passage for you. Matthew chapter 11, it's so important because right at verse 27, we have this idea of how Jesus shows us the Father. Matthew eleven twenty seven 27 says this. Listen to what it says. All things have been handed over to me by my Father. And no one knows the Son except the Father. And no one knows the Father except the Son. Listen to this. And anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Now, some of you get hung up right there and you say, you see that? God doesn't desire to save everybody. And you miss the next verse. Listen to the next verse. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden. And Jesus says, I will give you rest. And then he says this, take my yoke upon you, learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. And through me, you'll find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy. And my burden is light. You see, the only way that we can know God as Father is through Jesus Christ. And it's not by accident. Listen. It's not by accident that the Bible ends with an invitation. At the end of the Bible, what does Jesus say? The same thing that he said in Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Come, and you take the water. Take it without price. I want to say something to you. I want you to really make sure that you're listening. If you're listening this morning, say amen. amen. The way between God and man is paved through Jesus Christ. You know what that means? When Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father except through me. You know what that means? Listen, it means this, if nothing else. It means that God is now reconciled with man. God is now reconciled with man through Jesus Christ. But now, man has to be reconciled to God. God's already reconciled with man. He has done that through Jesus Christ. Listen to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15 calls Jesus the last Adam. The la not the second Adam. Don't fall prey into thinking that there's a second Adam because if you say that, then there might be a third or a fourth. Jesus is the last every man. The way between the God, the, the, the way between God and man is reconciled through Jesus Christ. God is now reconciled with man through Jesus. But now it becomes imperative for every man to be reconciled with God. And the only way for you and me and us to be reconciled with a God who has made his reconciliation with us is the same way. It's through Jesus Christ. Have you been reconciled with God? He's already reconciled with you. 
It's time for some of you to go and tell that story. Not of a story of, a, of some God out there who may be mad at me, may be displeased with me. May... Because you get to call him Father through the Son, whatever, whatever God says of the Son, he now says of you. What did he say about his son? That one's mine. I am well pleased. Jesus said, I always do what pleases the Father. And some of you say, I can't say that. You're right. In and of yourself, you cannot say that. But by grace, through faith, you can. Because he loves you. What did Paul say in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20? He meant it. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I live, I live by faith in the one who loved me and gave himself for me. So now, beloved believer, you get to say what Paul says in Romans chapter 8. Listen to what Paul says in Romans chapter 8 in verse 15. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you've received the spirit of adoption as sons and daughters by whom we cry, Daddy, Father. Listen to the Trinitarian language. Don't miss this. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ provided we suffer with him in order that we may be glorified in him. It's my prayer that when you think about the privilege of knowing God, that you will delight in the fact to call him God our Father. Father, thank you so much for loving us. Thank you, Lord God, for never leaving us. Thank you, Lord God, that you're the greatest. And Father, Hosea tells us, and I didn't even get there this morning, but Hosea tells us that there are so many privileges, so many privileges, privileges that you have guaranteed privileges that you've delivered, privileges that are ours through Jesus Christ. Thank you for being our Father. And thank you for sending the Son. And thank you for sealing us with the power of the Holy Spirit so that, Lord, we don't get to just know about God we get instead to know your name. Through Christ our Lord, we pray. And all of God's people said, amen. Well, we're going to do something just a little different today during our time of invitation. For our time of invitation, we're going to partake in the Lord's Supper. As, as, uh, as Tom, not Paul, I'm looking for Paul. This is Tom. <laughs> There's not a Paul up here, is there? Okay. As, uh, as, as Tom has mentioned, we're going to partake in the Lord's Supper by intention today. And so that will mean, of course, that you take the bread and you dip it into the cup. But listen to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and this will serve as our time of response. 1 Corinthians 11 says in the following instructions, I don't commend you, 
Because when you come together, it's not for the better, but for the worse.